So um, my name is Julian Sefton Green. I work at Deakin University, and it's my pleasure to introduce and nominally chair this panel, which is on um, the Pandemic Parenting Project, which is a project that's been running out of the Center of Excellence. But just before I introduce the participants and the aim of the uh, panel, I just want to make a few introductory remarks about connected learning, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. So connected learning um, as a um, concept, as a synthetic theory, and as a practice, um, as we'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow, has as its heart the idea of the relation, it has as its heart both a research project and a normative intervention. So both a way of finding out about and a way of turning into a program, the relationship between young people's interests, which might exist entirely outside of other spheres of influence, their interests, their relationship with peers and peer culture, and thirdly, the world of schooling and formal education, or what the Americans, which is where the Connected Learning Network originated, called academics. So you have, if you look at the diagrams for Connected Learning Online, which you can find very quickly, you've got a Venn diagram, which has a relationship between interests, peers, and academics. And sometimes that terminology changes, but what above all I want to get across to you now about this model is that the idea of three separate spheres that have an interlocking heart originated in a world where digital technology in the early 2000s was assumed to begin to break down the relationship between the spheres. And we were all really interested in how your interest as a young person might relate to peer culture or may or may not be um, understood and uh, responded to by formal education. So the project was all about the relationships between the boundaries between, sometimes the connectedness between, and sometimes the lack of connectedness between these three spheres. That's at the heart of the connected learning model, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. And the reason I wanted to talk about that now is because the pandemic project, parenting project, which I had the great pleasure to be involved in, um, and you're going to hear about now, came about as a result, as is pretty obvious really, of the pandemic. And it explored the fact that the relationship between these spheres, young people's interests, their peer cultures and schools, was completely broken down by the pandemic. When everybody was locked down and stuck at home, when the only definition of learning was what schools wanted, um, how to progress, how to get credentials. When the boundaries which we were interested in investigating connected learning didn't matter anymore, what happened? How did people make sense of what was happening in the home? How did people make sense of all the different worlds, all the different experiences you could have through connections online, through the screen, and so forth? So the Pandemic Parenting Project, in a way, was, was a great, is a great um, challenge to the principles of connected learning. And I think that's why it's such an exciting project for us to do. And it came about historically because Rebecca Willett, who you're going to hear from in a minute, who's professor um, of information science at Madison, Wisconsin in the States, um, wanted to set up an international comparative study examining the ways that different families in different countries responded to the pandemic and responded to the challenge of all being stuck at home and working out what learning meant and what, what education could meant. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the panel. You're going to hear first online from Rebecca, who um, should be fast asleep. I mean, she's a grown woman, so she can do what she likes, but she lives, she's living in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And then you're going to hear from different partners on the project. And it's a real pleasure, personally, for me to introduce Hyun Song Jung, who's a friend and colleague from South Korea, who is one of the partners in the project. And then, no, less of a pleasure, but um, not quite as uh, exotic in this particular context, uh, Sarah Healy, who was a research fellow at Deakin and is now at uh, the University of Melbourne. And finally, uh, Andy Zhao, who is a research fellow at Deakin University. And they were all part of um, this huge global project that they'll tell you all about in more detail. I can't remember exactly how many countries were involved, seven, eight? So we've got four, rep four, four national representatives of an eight country project who will tell you about um, the findings of the Pandemic Parenting Project. So I'm gonna hand over to Andy, who I think is gonna cue Rebecca's uh, pre-recorded um, talk now. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Willett, and I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Information School. I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today, um, and thank you for allowing me to contribute to this panel virtually. The panel will be sharing some findings from a wider project about family media practices during the pandemic. The four of us are connected with the Center of Excellence for the Digital Child, but the project included researchers from outside the center at various universities. We gathered together this wonderful group of researchers who brought different insights to the project. Our research focuses on the experiences of parents and caregivers of children ages 4 to 11 in the seven countries um, indicated on the screen. I will provide a brief introduction to the project before the panelists present their papers. So our project started during the pandemic because we knew that children's media use was increasing dramatically as a result of lockdowns and social distancing practices. So, for example, parents in all the countries in the study reported having to supervise children's remote schooling on screens. And parents all reported more media use because there were no extracurriculars to occupy children while parents were working and trying to get the household chores done. Um, there were fewer options for family entertainment or outings. Socializing was all being done on screens and so on. So children's lives during the pandemic became even more digital by default. And we wanted to know how parents were thinking about these changes. This image represents a very idealized vision for remote learning and for children's media use. In contrast, we found the situation a little bit more like this. One parent trying to do some work on a laptop and have a phone conversation while trying to keep the youngest child occupied and supervise the older child's remote learning and serve and eat breakfast and lunch. Parents in all countries reported the situation much more like this. Um, a very stressful time trying to supervise children's remote learning, trying to support their children's social and emotional well-being, keeping children fed and clothed and entertained at a time when parents themselves were coping with work and health and family separation um, and so on. So today you'll be hearing three papers which take different lenses on the experience represented on the screen. So just a little bit about the project. We followed the same research protocol in each of the seven countries. That is, we conducted semi-structured interviews over Zoom with 20 to 24 parents um, or caregivers in each of the countries. We also employed a photo elicitation method in which parents selected a photograph that really tried to capture the key elements and feelings of their experience of digital parenting during the pandemic. Together as a group of researchers, we've gone through a process of identifying themes that I've listed here on the screen, and then we considered different theoretical frames to explain families' digital lives within each of these themes. We're particularly excited to bring these frameworks to studies of children and media as a way of considering how the pandemic might have changed parents and caregivers' perceptions of children and media, as well as how researchers might draw on new frameworks for future research. If you'd like more information, please feel free to contact the panelists or me. And also for a deep experiential dive into the data, please visit our Connected Learning Metaverse Showcase at the tiny URL indicated here. Thank you and enjoy the panel. Hi, um, I'm Hyunsun Jung and uh, from Gyeonggi National University of Education in South Korea. I'm really uh, grateful and excited to be here in person. And my presentation is going to focus on parents as enablers and constrainers of children, uh, children's digital literacy, particularly focusing on parents' experiences of screen-mediated remote schooling during the pandemic. First, let me explain some of the South Korean context. Before the pandemic, there were significant limitations on students' use of digital technology within the typical school setting. Except for the pilot schools, 
for the use of digital technology. Although digital devices and programs have been widely used by children and in society outside school. We have national level policies to prevent internet and smartphone over-dependence. Remote schooling was introduced as a form of screen-mediated pedagogy from the very beginning of the pandemic. Although schooling during the pandemic was a combination of in-person and remote schooling, remote schooling made the use of screen media as the default of former schooling, and it accelerated the government's digital-based innovation initiative that is being pushed forward now after the pandemic. These are the theoretical frameworks and questions. As a part of Sponsors of Literacy, which are agents who enable, support, teach, model, as well as recruit, regulate, suppress, or withhold literacy and gain advantage by in some way, parents can offer children meaningful opportunities for communication, which develop their skills, knowledge, and understanding across a di diverse range of modes uh, through various family uh, literacy, uh, digital literacy practices. Parents can embrace digital technology either for themselves for, uh, or for their children. They also try to have balance by encouraging some digital practices and uh, not others often ad hoc, weighing opportunities and risks, salient in the present or future. They can also try to resist unstoppable incursion of digital technology into family life. In the centralized education system in South Korea, most parents seem to have respected the school's definition of learning and try to mirror at home the kinds of learning they understand to be taking place at school, but there were some other parents who tried to offer different kinds of learning that they thought would be better than screen-based learning during the pandemic. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. So uh, now I'm going to pre uh, present four parents as case studies. My research questions are, what kinds of digital literacy might be enabled and constrained by parents? How and why? What might uh, they have felt about their experiences? OK, so these are the uh, four cases. Uh, I just uh, named like case one, two, three, four moms. <laughs> yeah. So case one mother was one of the parents who respected the school's pedagogy. Like many parents, she felt that she needed to sit next to her child to help, and she was relieved that her spouse worked from home and was able to help her daughter with her digital literacy for learning. She also provided her daughter with a private screen-mediated learning platform called Elihai because she was worried about the learning gap. Uh, she embraced her daughter's use of screen media, especially her smartphones, as she was now able to see the educational aspect. However, she wanted her daughter to balance her screen media use in a manner that would allow her to self-regulate the purpose, duration, and priority of media use over schoolwork. She chose this image of frustration to represent her experiences. So she made a lot of efforts, but she was quite um, frustrated. And some parents experienced difficulties keeping pace with the continual introduction of new software by their children's teachers. Despite their willingness to develop their children's digital literacy for remote learning. Case 2 parent said that she initially managed to provide digital equipment and support her child's use of it. But the constant influx of new software led her and her child becoming lost again. again. In the process of learning these tools, reinforcing her feeling that she was digitally incompetent. This highlights uh, the existence of a digital divide among parents. 
She also voiced concern regarding their children's access to media. She realized that prior to the pandemic, her daughter used screen media in limited ways during school hours. But with remote learning, her child had constant access to screen media at home. She still desired to limit her child's exposure to screen media, but found it challenging to do so in practice. Case 3 mom was a university professor and frequently worked from home. This provided her with a chance to see what her children do with the digital media and what they prefer. She differentiated between consumption and production-based media use of children and tried to have arguments with her husband over how children's screen media should be seen and regulated as she thought that digital media can provide positive and valuable opportunities for children to explore their creativity. She seemed to embrace her children's creative use of digital media, but she still wanted her children to have balance between time spent online and offline and wanted to have complete control over her children's screen time. She also tried to resist screen time, taking up most of her children's daily routine by li uh, limiting their screen time to balance it with other activities, such as family conversations and reading books that did not involve screen media. To do so, she spent a lot of money to replace all their family devices, smartphones, tablets, and laptops with apples, and created an apple ecosystem, as she put. So she picked these like a lot of money and also lots of devices, images. The last case, parent uh, resisted screen-mediated remote schooling by withdrawing their children from mainstream schools. She chose an alternative school because she was concerned about her children's over-dependence on digital technologies. She also had a negative experience with screen-mediated private educational platform. She sent her sons to an alternative school after the pandemic began that provided an in-person instruction, except for a month when the pandemic became very severe. She has resisted her children's use of digital technology as much as possible, hardly using their laptop computers and iPads at home. She strongly believed that children should meet their teachers and other children in person in school. Her decision to withdraw from online education seemed to be an attempt to have a balance between her children's online and offline activities. So in conclusion, analyzing the data, I felt that the parents' responses to remote schooling would not be just as pandemic-related, uh, but, but as a reflection of ways parents are positioned through discourses of digital parenting, pandemic or not. Thank you. Thanks, hi Anson. So now we travel to Melbourne, which um, garnered a lot of attention over the pandemic. And this little slice of our project is being presented as Connected Learning and Cultural Institutions, the case of Melbourne. I'm going to introduce the role of the cultural institution in enhancing parents' affinity with children's digitally mediated lives so as to cultivate connectedness in and across digital life worlds. It's quite a mouthful, so I thought I'd write it up there as well. So children's intensified use of digital technologies during the pandemic lockdowns elicited a range of emotionally charged responses from parents, as we just heard. Um, there was anxiety and fear, but also joy and laughter. Given anxiety and fear in relation to parenting and digital technologies has received a lot of attention, uh, 
We were interested today in shining a light on positive responses. So we set out exploring the kinds of children's media practices that generate joyful, appreciative, pleasantly surprised or happy responses from parents. We found that Australian parents responded positively when they perceived their children as using digital technology for creative purposes, which could look like anything from stop motion animation, traditional kind of creative uses of digital tech, to PowerPoint presentations. However, when parents didn't perceive their child's activity as creative or educational, it was often dismissed, no matter how creative it might have seemed to somebody else. So, the data started to show us that creativity has, in many instances, become a proxy for parental approval, which is a little troubling because as well documented in creativity's literature, which I'm not going to drag you through today because there's not enough time, uh, creativity is not a self-evident good. So when it becomes a proxy for parental approval of children's uptake of digital technologies in the home, it really warrants some attention. In particular, it raises the question of how understandings of creativity have come about in response to social and historical events, including the pandemic, and how these understandings of creativity then shape digital life worlds of children today. And what kinds of past encounters with creativity are associated with more generative conceptualizations of children's gen digital creativity in the now? So, I'm proposing that generative conceptions of children's digital creativity can be aligned with a connected arts learning approach, as discussed in greater length by uh, Pepler, Dan, and Ito in a recent article. But in, in essence, it's about engaging in an area of interest supported by relationships and community and in ways connected to opportunity. And in this particular content, quality arts organisations, and I would also say um, gardening organisations, creative gardening organisations, are said to cultivate networks and interests across settings. So let's turn to a little bit of data. Lisa's a mother of three primary school aged children. And at inf interview, she tells me, my daughter, who was 10, 11 at the time, and the other two kids just started making iMovies. Just like, and they were hilarious, like just so creative. They also got into making trailers. You know, they're out in the backyard with the three chickens and the cat and the, you know, the story of the chicken and the doom of cats. And my husband and I cried with laughter at the nightly movie showing. And I think just for someone who just sees a lot of the negatives that tech brings, it was so lovely to see how technology brought my kids together in this collaborative experience, which was really entertaining for my husband and I as well. So it was super unexpected and special. Parents like Lisa, whose children had garnered enough know-how to use digital media, like iMovies, welcomed their children's engagement with these digital activities during the long days of lockdown. Many children in these circumstances had gained their movie skills at programs run by cultural institutions such as ACME, which is the Australian Centre for Moving Image, for those of you not familiar. The combination of prior experiences and a relaxation of rules around free time and screen time created the conditions for affirming open, generative and joyful encounters. This could also be said for parents such as Holly, who made the most of online offerings during the pandemic, such as that um, offered by the Art Centre. So, Holly says, so finding and using tools that the NGV put up online and also the Art Centre, we did quite a few Art Centre activities in the early lockdowns. They had, you know, something called Mountain Goat Mountain, which was this audio show where you could sort of act it out in your lounge room and move along with the story. And Sophie used to go to a little art school and, and they moved completely online. And, and like we did a Peppa Pig class with about 70 children from all around Australia. And they're all sitting 
watching a screen and painting together. It was, yeah, it was really good. There was the aspect of being able to maintain cultural arts sort of exposure. I found it interesting that Peppa Pig, when brought to you by an arts organisation, is framed as a creative experience when watched on TV is not. However, that's a whole another conversation. So to conclude, pandemic parenting data from Melbourne in particular suggests cultural institutions such as ACME and the Melbourne Arts Centre, but also arts organisations more generally can play a crucial role in not only providing opportunities for children to get creative with and through digital technologies, but also play a crucial role in expanding parents' conceptualisations of what counts as digital creativity, priming them to respond critically, yet affirmatively to the continuously changing landscape of children's digital life worlds. This is a, quite a small but significant point considering parents of younger children are largely responsible for regulating the type, quality and quantity of digital access. And I hand you over now to Andy. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Andy, I'm a research fellow with Deakin. Um, now I'd like to direct your attention to the role of the state in shaping um, children's experiences of learning in the digital age. So I'll focus on China as a case study to discuss how policy discourses um, define the meanings of learning and the risks of children's internet use, as well as contribute to constructing and configuring the connected learning environments for children. Now, there have been many um, policy interventions uh, focusing on children's learning and everyday life in China, but I'm just going to focus on a small number of examples today to illustrate the relationship between the state and the connected learning in the digital age. So in a way, I'm hoping to question if the connected learning model is possible in a context where state-led initiatives heavily influence or even dominate um, the various sides of learning for children, as well as the relationships between them. So this context, which is notably um, distinctive from the American and British context, based on which much connected learning research has been done, prompts us to critically think about the social, technical and political divides between countries and how uh, and if, um, oh, sorry, between the countries and how um, um, or if the connected learning approach can be applied across national contexts. And in addition, um, I want to ask what we can do to create more open, inclusive and peer-led learning experiences for children in these countries. Um, I don't think I have an answer by the end of my talk, so don't get your expectations high, but I'm looking forward to hearing what people think. I'll start with um, the four design principles for connected learning identified by Mimi Ito and colleagues um, in their seminal research agenda setting article um, 10 years ago, the four principles are um, everyone can participate, learning happens by doing, challenge is constant, and everything is interconnected. In China, however, the learning environment for children, and more generally their experiences of the internet across everyday settings, are subject to state um, interventions. And in these intervention, interventions, in the forms of laws, policies, and technological initiatives, define what children can and cannot do with the internet and when and how they do it. Here I'm going to briefly explain four main examples. The first is a law on the protection of minors, recently revised and updated in October 2020. A new chapter was added in this um, new version called Internet Protection. And the next two are two subsequent policy documents aimed at protecting children from online um, games addiction the two documents jointly restricted when children can access online games and define what kind of games are appropriate for children. And the last example is a built-in nationwide um, anti-addiction system mandated, mandated for most Chinese online platforms, including gaming, live streaming, and short video platforms called the teenage mode. And when this mode is turned on, 
the user will be limited to 40 minutes of um, uh, use and will be banned from the apps between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. every day. So unlike parental controls um, available in many other countries, the teenage mode is mandated by the state, although users, mainly parents, can make the decision whether the mode should be turned on or not for the children. Here are some more specific examples of how these policy discourses frame online games in relation to children's well-being and learning. And clearly, there's heavy focus on um, risks, addiction, and harm associated with online games and the internet more broadly. Um, whereas the social and learning benefits of children's gaming activity were not uh, properly acknowledged, not even to mention supported. In this sense, these policies and initiatives contribute to the normatization of a binary between learning and non-learning and the different sides of learning and entertainment or non-learning. And in relation to the environments for connected learning, more protection is mandated than supportive mechanisms and more barriers created than diversified pathways to participation and solidified boundaries between social settings and platforms were established. So the state, in the Chinese context, penetrates the domestic and institutional dimensions of children's everyday learning activities. I'd like to end my presentation with a few examples of how the parents actually responded to this state intervention, particularly in in, in to the um, latest policy online gaming um, restriction implemented in 2021. So I've kind of developed three categories. The first type of parent basically internalized this kind of policy dis discourse and agreed with um, the importance of restricting time and have these, having these policy interventions. The second time basically um, partly agreed with the need to restrict, but questioned the effectiveness of these policy interventions, whether they will work or not. Because like, yeah, um, a mother of an 11 year old said that my children never have their own accounts, all right? So they will use mine so I can control them. I don't need this policy kind of um, teenage mode or whatever that is. Whereas the last type of parent challenged this kind of flattened approach by saying, it does not necessarily, so the requirements, the restrictions do not necessarily work for all children because it basically applies to all children below 18. And we know that children are different, of course. So um, these type, type of parents basically questioned this kind of flattened one size fits all approach towards um, 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 regulating children's internet use. But I guess to end my presentation, just going back to my original question, what can we do? you know, to foster um, uh, inclusive environments for children's learning in contexts like in China and perhaps like in South Korea, I'm not sure, probably some of you will disagree, where um, um, state policies really intervene domestic spheres and institutional spheres, and they are really unavoidable, but potentially negotiable. So I just think there's need probably for more research into non-Western contexts particularly in relation to um, the connect connected um, learning model. And I think I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so we've got uh, five, seven minutes for questions before we move into data and datafication. Um, I'll ask the panelists yet to... Um, have we got somebody on the roving mics? or somebody to rove with the mics. Any questions about the project or any specific cases anybody wants to raise? Now, they've all moved into the position now, so you have to have... <laughs> uh, at the back there first. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my question's for Andy. I'm just relating your presentation back to the discussion we had earlier about the metaverse and thinking about um, relying on corporations to regulate. Is there evidence that there's a, w a way of controlling or managing um, children's use of digital technologies that is neither state-based nor too heavily reliant on like 
personal spheres of influence, families, parents, or even just relying on what the corporate corporation set as being responsible practice. Like what which what leads to the best outcomes for children and young people in their in their use of digital technologies? Thanks. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this question because um, if talking about China, what happens in China, I think platforms or companies are the proxies for the state because they implement what the policies say. Um, so the policies themselves technically is about platform governance and regulation. So it's about regulating these platforms and companies, but with the expectation that children are the beneficiaries of these sort of platform re regulation. So there's this kind of different layers of, of governance where the state makes policies and then they go to the platforms and the pl platforms implement these policies and to some extent interpret these policies and make create these kind of um, um, mechanisms and initiatives like the teenage mode for the children um, and then children uh, and families in general are the end users. I, I'm not sure if it's the best way to work um, because I think we're we are seeing potentially two extremes. One is heavily relied or, or, or dependent on the state whereas the other extreme is heavily dependent on the platforms expecting that the platforms will do the right thing. Um, but maybe it's the middle ground that really um, uh, is the way out, but I, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Thanks. Well, do you want to jump in here? Uh, I, I think if everybody went away from this conference trying to work out what the optimum model of governance for digital technology would be, and we came up with a little bit of the answer, I think it's just a great question. I, there is clearly no paradigm, there's no model which has the answer at present, but... Um, it's a constant state of negotiation. I think one of the things I learned from the presentations is even when there are preferred interpretations, individuals and individual families are going to find their own ways through that anyway. So it, the governance is never a, an absolute effect. Were you waving your hand? Susan has a question over there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know this study was undertaken during pandemic times. Uh, but I'm curious now that we've moved past that to some extent, quite a lot, I guess, um, are there any enduring patterns of behaviours or perspectives that you've heard from the families that have continued? So in terms of the legacy of family life, um, are there things that have changed forever, do you think, because of these particular set of circumstances? Or maybe you don't have that data, I understand that's also a possibility. Um, oh. Well, you use the hand oh, mic. The, yeah, it's okay. Um, I think we still need to find out more. So uh, one of the things that I want to do is uh, probably use similar questions uh, now uh, because after the pandemic and what's happening. And uh, we asked one of the questions to the parents whether they would think that they will go back to the old principles or and practices. And then, um, but many parents seem to, particularly in Korea, uh, uh, the parents had us uh, uh, valuable opportunities to think about some have um, questions and hesitations of what they heard that they should do from the um, digital parenting experts because they thought that you know like under um, um, in like children shouldn't be allowed to have like two more than two hours screen time every day but they found out that they were their children were already spending six, seven hours for um, remote schooling. And then now the uh, survey, uh, national survey shows that uh, South Korean uh, children's uh, screen time uh, average per day is more than eight hours. So uh, now um, I think it's the time we need to uh, have more flexible and, and practical guidelines and and that's one of the things that we found yeah and because uh, i as i just mentioned uh, the now the south korean government is pushing really forward uh, the digital um, ai digital 
textbook uh, development initiative uh, by the Ministry of Education. And, and uh, there will be more concerns, uh, I think. Uh, there will be more like some expectations, but also worries uh, about this initiative, about uh, how uh, we need to balance the children's screen time. Do you want a quick answer, Sarah? Yeah, just as a quick comment. Also, um, parents were quite clear that the children had aged two, three years, and a lot of what they did uh, was an acceleration of what they perhaps had planned to do anyway. So it's a really difficult, tricky question to answer without really going back to those families. But most of them did describe the ageing process as accelerating their decisions and that move into digital worlds that might have they might have delayed for another five ten years even and given that many of the um, debates about the effects of the pandemic has been about children's lack of growth of the, the gap that the pandemic has caused that's a really interesting point uh, and perhaps counterintuitive point on which to end so I want to thank I'm going to draw this to a close now because we're moving on to the next panel, but thank the panellists and Rebecca um, very much indeed, and, and thank you very much. <laughs>